Good morning. Uh, my name is Marcus Noland. I am the Executive Vice President and Director of Studies here at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I welcome you all here this morning for what I think is going to be a very interesting and timely presentation on attitudes towards trade policy of the American people. I was recently in Korea and someone asked me about what work I was doing on North Korea. And I told them, well, I'm actually doing um, uh, more work on trade policy these days. President Trump has uh, made the Peterson Institute more relevant than it's been in 30 years. Um, and uh, this presentation this morning could be uh, seen in that context of renewed interest and controversy about um, American trade policy. Uh, Stephen Cull is the Senior Research Associate and Director of the Program for Public Consultation at the University of Maryland School of Public Policy. He is a political psychologist who has spent uh, more than two decades uh, conducting in-depth studies of public opinion on policy issues. Mac Dessler is his colleague. I, he is the Saul I. Stern Professor uh, at uh, the University of Maryland's School of Public Policy. He has also uh, turned the remarkable trick of being both a chaired professor and a professor emeritus at the same time. Um, <laughs> I'll have to learn how to do that eventually. Um, Mac uh, served in the executive office of the President of the United States. He served at the State Department, a variety of think tanks, including PIIE, where he was the author of American Trade Politics, which went through at least four editions because I found this book this morning. Uh, this book was the recipient of the Gladys Kammerer Award of the American Political Science Association. Uh, in addition to this book, he wrote uh, uh, many, many books and articles, including one on the National Economic Council and a uh, rather obscure article that he co-authored with me that you will have to Google very intently uh, to track down. Anyway, uh, Steve and Mac have come loaded with a very extensive slide deck. So without further ado, I would like to turn the podium over to uh, Dr. Stephen Cull. Uh, he will be followed by uh, Professor Mac Dessler, and then three of us will go up here for Q&A. So, Steve. Thanks very much. Thanks for having us. Um, as you probably know, there has been substantial discuss discussion over the last few years about whether the liberal world order or the post-war world order is dead, whether uh, the public has abandoned uh, interest and support for uh, all kinds of institutions and agreements, whether it's, it's good in regard to international security, but also in regard to international trade. So we undertook a, uh, have decided to undertake a series of surveys on this broader question about the, the future of the post-war world order. And a big piece of that is related to the international trade regime. So um, working with Mac, uh, we uh, developed a series of uh, and a rather extensive survey. Now I should explain that we do an unusual kind of survey where we don't just ask standard poll questions. We take through people through a process where we uh, basically put them in the shoes of a policymaker, we give them a briefing, we have them evaluate arguments, pro and con, and then ultimately they give their input. The, this process that they go through, this online process they go through, is uh, reviewed by experts uh, across the spectrum of opinion to ensure that the presentation is accurate and balanced, uh, and that the arguments are in fact the best arguments being made. Oh, that's right. Uh, hmm. Oh, there we went. Did I hold it down too long? Okay, here we go. So um, the um, 
the survey was uh, fielded by uh, Nielsen Scarborough from April 10th to May 13th with uh, nearly 3,000 registered voters. Most questions, uh, well, some questions went to the full sample, some to the half sample. Make sure you got that. Okay, so first, with all of the, this whole series of surveys, we start by a brief presentation on the post-war international system. Okay. Let's see, I hope this gets better. So we explained that after World War II, the US together with most major countries in the world set up a number of international agreements and institutions. Many people think these agreements and institutions are still valuable and important, have served the US well and should be maintained even if they require some cost. Others think these agreements are no longer useful and the US should disengage from them so that it is freer to pursue its interests independently. And then we gave them a, a uh, uh, overview of the post-war international trade regime, uh, talked about the GATT, the whole notion of lowering trade barriers, what trade barriers are, tariffs, highly specific national regulations, talked, told them what the basic guiding principles of fairness are, um, and uh, what the, uh, about regional agreements as well as uh, um, global agreements. We asked them how familiar they are with this idea of promoting international trade by countries agreeing on a set of international rules that seek to lower barriers to trade and to ensure trade is done fairly. And two-thirds said that they at least had some awareness of it, uh, others so only a little or less, and not much difference between the parties. So we said there's some discussion these days about what the U.S. should do in regard to interna international trade. Some people think the U.S. should continue to seek to promote the growth of international trade through international agreements. Others think the trade has many negative effects and they oppose the growth of trade. So then we took them through a whole series of arguments. Now, you're going to see a lot of arguments up here on the screen. Fortunately, you have the report. If you want to dig into any one of them in particular, we're not going to go through every, the, uh, uh, through every one of them. Um, but the, just to give you a feel, the pro argument says international trade has played a key role in the growth of the American economy and the world economy. It has been a major factor in the unprecedented pre rise in the standard of living over the past 17 years. With foreign markets more open, U.S. producers can increase their production to sell to them. When markets are more open to imported goods, consumers benefit from lower prices, and so on. And that it encourages innovation and so on. So 74% found, found this argument convincing, including two-thirds of Republicans and a much larger number of uh, Democrats. Now on the con side, the emphasis is how the costs and benefits are unfairly distributed. While trade may be good for investors and high-skilled workers, in caloric consumer prices, it comes at great cost for many American workers and businesses. As the U.S. market gets opened up to cheap imports from low-wage countries, this undercuts American companies producing the same products, driving them out of business and throwing employees out of work and so on. And nearly as many found this convincing. Now, this, by the way, is not unusual. People are basically saying, hmm, yeah, that's a good point. Hmm, yeah, that's a good point too, right? Which is... We don't think that's a bad sign. It means that people are deliberating, thinking about both sides of it. But as you, as you may have noticed, there is a kind of mirror image flip-flop between the Republicans and the Democrats, where the, uh, the Democrats are uh, overwhelmingly finding the pro-argument convincing. And on the con side, the Republicans uh, reach that overwhelming stage, but still large majorities on both sides. Um, the, another pro-argument that it expands access, U.S. access to markets. Oh, that, that's actually a big winner on both sides. Overall, 79%, including 76% of Republicans. Um, but on the con side, it, it, it competing, it, it, it results in competition with low-wage workers and subsidized foreign companies. Republicans very responsive to that argument, two-thirds of Democrats. This is, I think, a really key thing for Republicans. This, per, this perception that the, that the U.S. is being taken advantage of, that others are skirting the rules more than the U.S., and I think that's a very important part. Um, I should emphasize in advance, sort of, you will see numbers ultimately today that are somewhat confusing, that some numbers that 
how do we put this all together? And that's going to be a challenge. But if you're finding a little, a little surprising, the degree of, oh, wow, they're agreeing with both sides so much. Yes, that's just the situation we're talking about. Very strong sense, feelings, perceptions that, that there are good things and there are bad things in this growth of trade. On the pro side, it creates export-related jobs. Again, overwhelming um, numbers on both sides, both parties saying, uh, finding that convincing. Uh, the argument that it results in the loss of jobs. Again, big numbers. And interestingly, bigger on the Republicans than, than the Democrats. Uh, the argument that it promotes cooperation and peace. Uh, overall, two-thirds Republicans bear majority on that. They're not entirely convinced on that. Well, all the Democrats are, are, are quiet. Uh, that it's a threat to sovereignty if our economy becomes very dependent on international trade. We have the potential to lose our independence and sovereignty. Um, overall, that doesn't do very well. Democrats don't buy that very well, but Republicans are quite responsive to it. Uh, the growth of trade lowers poverty around the world. Um, overall, that does quite well, three quarters, and, and uh, including two thirds of Republicans. Large, very large majority of uh, Democrats. And then there's the other side that it leads to uh, international exploitation and the race to the bottom. Uh, and that does pretty well, um, not as big as, as the others, a little stronger on the Republican side, interestingly, even though that's an argument that tends more to come from the left. So now after all this back and forth and back and forth, you might think that when we finally ask them the big question, what do you think? It might be somewhere in between, right? Somewhere in between these two numbers, right? But that's not what happens. An overwhelming majority of both parties say they approve of the US to other, together with other countries promoting international trade through a set of agreed on rules that seek to lower barriers to trade and to ensure trade is done fairly. So what does this mean? My, and we will have plenty more time to discuss what it all means, but I will just make one comment here. That overall, what you see here is that there is a kind of fundamental belief, a fundamental set of assumptions rooted in the post-war period that Americans really embrace as fundamental, as as. A, a direction to go. Now, you see a lot of co you know, poll questions that say, do you approve or disapprove of trade? Is trade mostly a good thing, mo trade mostly a bad thing? And those numbers swift, uh, shift and vary over, over the decades. They can go down and up and all. So how do, how do we reconcile that with this overwhelming number? Well, I think if you look at those pro and con arguments, you can see all the, the very the, the, the conflicting feelings about different aspects of trade, aspects of it, um, outcomes from it, different ways of pursuing it, and so on. But the fundamental question, should we have this system, is really not controversial. It is actually a foundation that we build up from. And that with, it's like you can complain how the game is being played, but nobody actually wants to quit the game. They don't really want to take up the ball and go home. And that, I think, that has been the question that people have been asking is, are the, all of these challenges, all these disruptions to the trade system, this change in the US posture in relation to, to the trade system, does that, is that reflect some, uh, some crumbling of this foundation? And th this, these numbers suggest, no, quite the contrary. It actually has brought to the surface the fact that it is uh, foundational. Uh, this is, by the way, very little, no, hardly any variation across ages. Um, and, um, um, and also in terms of education, sorry for the incorrect uh, <laughs> length of bars here, the numbers are correct, um, the, the lengths aren't, aren't right, but uh, there's very little variation by, by education as well, though that has widely, been widely assumed to be, to be the case. Now, the US participation in the World Trade Organization, we didn't actually get around to this until after they went through a series of uh, uh, evaluations of ways to mitigate the uh, uh, negative effects of trade. 
And uh, we presented, uh, explained what, how it works and so on, and, and said that the uh, U.S., the pro-argument said the world order that was established uh, has produced a period of remarkable economic growth and presented in human history, and the World Trade Organization has been uh, uh, effective in, in, in maintaining it and so on. And again, large numbers, same basic pattern, two-thirds of Republicans, overwhelming majority of Democrats. Now, on the con side, there's an interesting dynamic here. The argument goes the WTO is not really necessary for the US. The US has so much leverage because of its large market can probably get a better deal negotiating directly with other countries than working through an inefficient and unwieldy organization like the WTO. Working with 163 other nations, the US has to make a lot of compromises just to get along. Furthermore, the WTO makes many rules and the US follows them, but a lot of other countries like China do not. The US does better when it is free to act on its own. 70% of Republicans find that convincing, only a third of Democrats. And there you start seeing this kind of fissure that's, a, that's emerged between the Republicans and the Democrats, that basically the Republicans are, because so a large number of Republicans said, we fully support the system, but we don't want to, we, we, but we, we're not completely happy with this idea of being constrained by the WTO. And then the final question, 54% still of Republicans still said they approve but remember, they responded very well to that argument, and it isn't a large majority. Overall, 72% approve of the U.S. continuing to be part of the World Trade Organization. So I think uh, I'm going to wrap it up here and, and, and pass the ball to Mac. But I think that that's a very important thing to follow. It's, it, it's not the extent to which there is a push against the system. It is a readiness to push the limits to not be constrained by it, maybe to break the rules, you know, you can't be good all the time, um, to, 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 to stretch the system and see if we can get a better deal, right? But not actually to undermine the system. We want the system uh, to, uh, to move forward. The Democrats, on the other hand, they have means to try to mitigate the negative effects that, that Mac is going to go over. They have means, but they, those generally involve government intervention, government programs, and the Republicans are not entirely happy about that. So they're drawn to the idea of looking for a way to push against the limits while still maintaining the system. I'm going to pass it on to Mac now. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, before I, uh, I think it's really, before I run quickly through the rest of our major findings and questions, I'm going to make a couple of comments. Interest, it's interesting that both Democrats and Republicans ended up strongly pro-trade in the final question. And Stephen's explanation of why, of why the Republicans were more dissatisfied in certain aspects of it is quite interesting. But I think the, the Trump has obscured something that's been happening for a while. And that over, this, over the 21st century, the party, there's been a significant party shift in views on trade. Uh, Democrats have become more pro-trade. Republicans have become more cr critical. This is quite different from the way it was in the la last quarter century before that. And uh, it'll become particularly evident when, when you see our numbers on how people think about NAFTA, which Democrats have been very resistant to, and Republicans have been supportive. But anyway, there is an interesting, uh, uh, if you look at, there's a, we, this is not our poll, so we didn't put on the poll, but this is a, a poll uh, anybody can look at if they want to, from Gallup essentially saying, the question is, do you believe Foreign trade is mainly an opportunity for the United States or a problem for the United States. And if you look for it, uh, basically, um, in 2001 to 2011, Republicans are always higher, saying it is an opportunity for the United States than Democrats thereafter. But, but by diminishing margins by 2011 and 2012 to 2016, Democrats are found to be more supportive. Uh, so there's similar shifts in Chicago on foreign relations, Chicago Council on Global Affairs polls, and in uh, uh, Pew polls. Um, 
the uh, now public opinion now is in sharp contract, which contrast with what presumably are still the party divisions, although they're less on trade and their sense of Republicans uh, being worried about uh, Trump's uh, pushing uh, the uh, threatening the system. Now, um, about 60 years ago, some of you who are trade veterans remember, I, I, there was a book by Power, Poole, and Dexter, which was the definitive academic study of trade at the time. And they found an amazing political verse, reversal with Democrats becoming more trade skeptical and Republicans becoming more positive about trade. A con sharp contrast to the century before that. Now, we may, be in, we may be in the midst of another amazing political reversal, but Trump has to some degree shuffled the deck, and we'll have to see. Now, I, oh, so anyway, that I think is, we may be, we may be seeing, seeing a reversal of the reversal, but we shall have to see. Um, the, uh, now, let me go through various things. Uh, Stephen talked about Democrats being more supportive of measures to mitigate the effects of trade, like training, like unemployment insurance. And this is pretty clear in the, uh, in the following. First, question of increasing unemployment benefits. The, uh, this is once again pro and con arguments uh, and um, growth of trade it hurts some workers so they should be helped. and. It, then the negative argument for unemployment help is it kills people's motivation to get new jobs. Again, these you can read these in the report. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, basically, then we ask them uh, the um, whether you should uh, increase the period for which the we talk to them about differences in different state benefit programs, et cetera, et cetera. Then we said, do you think we should increase the period for uh, unemployment insurance. And interestingly here, basically there's a, a wash or a slight negative leaning in terms of whether you continue to increase the period with Republicans particularly skeptical and Democrats kind of sort of supportive. But then when you ask whether you should increase the amount, they're much more strong, much stronger support when they're told what the level of unemployment benefits is. You see a national and pretty heavy bipartisan support for that, 70% of Dem Republicans, 85% of Democrats. They, uh, moving to, and then once again with a maximum weekly amount of, this is a similar question, but a somewhat different question and similar strong increase. So if so people are against increasing the level, or increasing the length to very marginally, but they're strongly in favor of uh, increasing the maximum amount. What about worker retraining and education? Once again, we get our pro and con arguments. One is government, you know, government is responsible for negotiating expansions of trade. Therefore, it has an obligation to help those who are left behind and should be trained for that purpose. This is the pro, this argument. The, uh, then the con is, well, government shouldn't really be involved in training. They don't know how to do it. The private sector knows what they want, et cetera. So it's better, better to leave that to the private sector. And the, uh, again, another set of pro and con arguments. It's good to make it, we ought to be thinking of our overall workforce and making it globally competitive, et cetera, et cetera. Other countries are spending much more on doing that than we are. And so it would be a good idea. So it's kind of pr pretty strongly supported, but then if the government should not do this, should not be planning the economy. Again, you have a partisan division, uh, Republicans, uh, strongly con supporting this con argument. Democrats, not too supportive. The, uh, but anyway, you get the, on balance, uh, should we increase spending on retraining and educational programs? Somewhat surprising to me, a slight plurality for not increasing. For de People are asked, they're given the $6 billion number and asked whether you would increase or decrease that. That's a total, that's not just trade adjustment, that's all 
programs. And the question was, should it be increased or decrease? And this slight, very slight margin for decreasing. Uh, once again, Republicans want to, are skeptical and Democrats are more supportive. Uh, when you start asking people about specific fields to train for, it's interesting, you get a much more positive. You say cybersecurity, I guess, is felt to be an urgent need. So should we train people for cybersecurity? 81% say yes. And then if you ask them about the energy industry, you get 82% saying yes. The, uh, so quite, if you ask them about tax credits for apprenticeships, 83% say yes. So uh, it's, um, then if you, add, so basically, when you asked about increasing spending, you get skepticism, but when you asked very, about very specific pur purposes, you get more positive support. Now what about trade adjustment assistance specifically? Uh, the other questions tended to be, uh, the answer uh, was, um, the argument for standard argument benefits trade benefits Americans for lower prices, but they are uh, it hurts some people. They should we should do something, some of the distribute redistribute some of the gains from trade to easing the plight of those. And again, as Stephen suggested, on these remedial measures, you have a sharp party division. Eighty-four percent of Democrats support. It's fifty-seven percent, still a significant number of Republicans support that argument. Con argument, uh, government doesn't know how to do this, private industry is more effective. That's um, strong, the party split is the other way, and Republicans tend to support that. And, but a significant minority of Democrats are skeptical as well. The, uh, then final recommendation on whether we expand trade adjustment assistance. A solid majority, 58% nationally, favor that, and, but only 40% of Republicans, as you can see, and 74% of Democrats. We've essentially put independence on these charts. We haven't talked about independence. They tend to, they tend to fall in between the Republican and the Democratic responses. Then if you ask, uh, then the, we ask the question, and this one is, the numbers are a little bit, hard to follow. I, I wanted to ask this question, but it was hard to figure out exactly how to do it, is the whole question of whether there should be a trade-specific adjustment program, or whether it should be extended to all workers. And by and large, you sort of get, this was for part of a sample. It's a part sample question, why you have, why it doesn't add up to 100%. And again, the Republicans are against this. Democrats are for spreading it to all, but there's not, I, Obviously not an overwhelming consensus with a national total of 58%. Now, labor and environmental standards was a very hot issue in the 1990s with Democrats arguing their opposition to both NAFTA and later trade agreements was that because they said this is a... Uh, uh, we need labor and environment are being hurt by trade, and we need strong labor and environment. And so we've asked, this isn't the first time we asked this question, and we asked gay pro and con on both sides, which I will run through very quickly. But what's interesting is, is as before on these, you get overwhelming majorities of both parties supporting labor and environmental standards as part of trade agreements, whereas, of course, the trade community has traditionally been more skeptical of this, thinking they sort of interfere with and may reduce our leverage. Anyway, this is the pro and con on labor standards. Final, 89%. Very little party difference here. 93 for Democrats, 86 for Republicans. Environmental standards, similar pro and con arguments. Uh, and we end up with 86% in favor. So the, uh, so, um, now, fi okay, finally, so, okay, so now this is a question we asked some people who, said, who didn't initially favor expansion of trade if we take these mitigating steps, 
would this would you switch to supporting the expansion of trade? And you get a marginal switch. You get a, those four percent which of the public would switch to uh, support of trade with the institution of some of these programs. The, uh, um, and as you can see, that's pretty consistent across parties. Okay, now finally, and maybe most controversially and difficult to poll because it's a moving target, is the question of use of recent uses of trade, of tariffs for trade. Uh, first step, uh, the administration imposed steel and aluminum tariffs, as I'm sure all of you are familiar with. And uh, the, uh, we gave him pro and con arguments. You know, this, this is necessary for security, uh, counter for China, it counters Chinese dumping, et cetera. Um, but then the second argument is no, it's basically just an excuse for protectionism. There's no real security problem. And basically uh, saying, you know, the notion that Canada and the UK wouldn't sell to us is is not valid, is not reasonable. Uh, so anyway, when you get to the, the then again, uh, pro, it would help the U.S. steel industry, con, no, there's no real threat to the steel industry, so we should stick to the rules on these. Final recommendation is very split, essentially a wash. 51% support the tariffs, 48% approve. Just so... Uh, oppose them. So what's interesting here is, despite what Stephen highlighted is the overall support for free trade, people are not against imposing specific measures. So I suppose the administration could take some comfort in that number. Okay, tariffs on China. Again, uh, the arguments, it's the only way to stop China. You got to get tough. They're, they're violating the rules, particularly on intellectual property. We've done bilateral agreements with them, and we've submitted complaints to the WTO, but China's not stopped its unfair practices. But it's time for us to take stronger measures. Then this con is China's not the first country to violate these laws, nor will it be the last. We need to approach this problem by using the world's rules and systems that were built specifically for these problems and which have solved them in the past, et cetera. And that gets strong democratic support, but not strong, but minority Republican support. And again, oh, wait a minute, did I? Okay, then only way to stop China, the WTO doesn't work. I, I say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going back. I'm, I was doing brilliantly managing this until recently, and now I seem to, oops. Now. Okay, there we go. All right. Got it, got it, got it. Down yeah, it's a down arrow, yeah, okay. Um, what, why, I just, yeah, you okay, here we go. Um, then again, a wash on wh whether we should impose these. We then asked him whether we should impose additional tariffs if China didn't uh, uh, respond to this. And on that, you got more skepticism. 30, uh, don't impose additional ones without going to the WTO first. The, uh, and so there's a sense that maybe among the public that enough is enough. We shouldn't get carried away with these things. Okay, finally, North American trade. As we all know, President Trump's administration has renegotiated some provisions of NAFTA and submitted them to Congress. We gave the respondents a summary of the main changes in NAFTA, including auto rules of origin, including some, some of the rules for digital trade and some other changes. Uh, then, but we first asked them, based upon what you oppose or favor the U.S. being in the agreement. And this is, one, in some ways, to me, the most, one of the most remarkable numbers. Throughout the 1990s and the first decade of the 20th century, there was Democrats who were skeptical about NAFTA and Republicans who were supportive. Now you find 88% of Democrats strongly or somewhat favor NAFTA and only 55% of Republicans. Now, some of this is doubtless uh, 
influenced by Trump and his notion that he's going to improve it with his agreement, but it's still a, quite a, a striking change. Okay, so now uh, argument for the new U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement. Uh, an argument is pu pulling out of it. We should basically agree with it. It's good for U.S. workers, helps auto companies, dairy producers, and dr drug companies. It makes it harder for the Mexicans to undercut. On balance, it's a good deal. Republicans in particular, but both parties support this argument. Then it's better than this is a kind of another pro-argument, kind of a lukewarm one. Okay, it doesn't really do that much, but we want to keep NAFTA, and this may be the price maybe the price for doing it, and so we should basically go along with this. Uh, that's where Democrats find, uh, like that argument, you know, we'll, we'll sort of bite our tongues or whatever you call it and support that. Um, NAFTA is not, the, those who sort of start with, NAFTA hasn't been good for American workers and the new provisions aren't enough to make a difference. Uh, interestingly, this gets more support from Republicans and Democrats, but it's not, not heavily supported. For most, compared to most arguments we give, 55% is not a, not a strong number. Another con is contrary to the principles of free trade. As many trade experts have pointed out, the re new regulations on uh, <laughs> automobiles are, are managed trade and may, be, may set back competitiveness over the long run, et cetera. Uh, but, and this argument, but therefore we should just keep, we should, uh, the positive addresses uh, of free trade are diluted by the new one, and therefore we, Congress should vote against it. Final recommendation, and this is interesting, and probably fairly substantially driven by, by Trump and allegiance to Trump. National vote for it, 53%, vote against it, 45%. Uh, and Republicans vote for 64 percent, Democrats 43 percent, and 54 percent of Democrats say vote against it. So this may actually reflect, to some degree, unlike some of the other poll numbers, may reflect current, may be consistent with current political alignments in Congress. But that, uh, so, that's I guess a, oh, final question. Suppose it doesn't pass, what should we do? 63% uh, <coughs> say stay in NAFTA, but 56% of Republicans say withdraw. 83% say Democrats say st stick to it. And that's all she wrote, or at least all we're gonna present this morning. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have a fair amount of time for questions and answers. There is a roving mic if you're up in the front. There's also a standing mic. Uh, if you want to use the standing mic, just feel free to go stand there. Um, I, that was a really interesting presentation. And I had two reactions, which I will attempt to fr frame as a question. So um, I recently wrote a paper that was that's sitting outside, uh, if you would like to read it, um, which looks at county level um, voting patterns in the 2016 election. And so the, my reaction, having written that paper, is um, so you present this public opinion survey data that basically paints a very positive picture of Americans' attitudes towards trade. So my reaction is, if that's correct, then why has the actual political outcomes with regard to trade steadily deteriorated over 10, 15 years, and then really deteriorated under Trump? So you could point to the fact that um, it took lengthening amounts of time to for Congress to approve 
any of these uh, various uh, regional free trade agreements. And then under Trump, you know, things have really kind of fallen off the, the, the cliff. Um, and my response, having written the paper, is that you guys have produced a very interesting um, public opinion uh, analysis of trade issues, but that's too narrow a lens. That the basic problem or the answer to my political question is that Americans conflate trade attitudes towards foreigners, immigration, attitudes towards domestic minorities, and so on. And that sort of, the fact that trade is not viewed in isolation, but is viewed specifically through race, through lenses of race, primarily, um, education, um, growing diversity in your local area, and so on, explains why, in a narrow sense, they may have what appear to be positive attitudes towards trade, but the actual political outcomes appear to be very negative. So uh, I, I will start with that, and then we now have some people lined up to ask questions. Am I on? If you push the button, you are. Oh, good. Um, I, I'd really want to emphasize that we didn't simply find that people are positive about trade. Um, all of those con arguments did pretty well. All, all those critiques did quite well. There's a, a, a tremendous desire to mitigate negative effects of trade. What we found was that, at a, that there's a kind of foundational support for the objective, for the goal of ultimately achieving this, this growth of trade through a trade regime. But there's dissatisfaction with many of the outcomes, with many of the aspects of it. The inequality, the, 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 the damage to certain workers, the unequal effects, the loss of jobs going overseas, and so on and so forth. So the, the, the politics of the thing is really not uh, fundamentally about trade, not trade. It's about how well uh, each policymaker is doing in terms of mitigating the negative effects of trade. And Republicans are uneasy about any kind of government program for mitigating the, the negative effects of trade, while Democrats are more in favor of it and seem to have, have over the years consolidated that, that view. While Republicans um, have, have become more frustrated and have become responsive to a political leader who says, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm not going to be as constrained as the U.S. has. I, I'm tired of being, we're, we don't have to be the, you know, the, the people in charge upholding the system while others like China push the edges and kind of bend the rules or break them outright. Maybe we'll do some of those things sometimes. So some of the arguments that actually said, you know, we should abide, keep abiding by the rules, and some that that those don't always fly with fly with uh, uh, fly with all the Republicans. So I really do want to emphasize that this shows a picture of conflict about how to do it, conflict about how to run the ship. But nobody's talking about sinking the ship or taking it back to port and going uh, going some other way. There is a there is a there is cohesion on that level, even while on the surface there is tremendous amount of conflict about how it should be done. Let me add some comment. I mean, Mark is, of course, right that trade isn't the whole story in American politics 2016 and thereafter. And uh, the um, <coughs> um, is striking that Democrats did very well in 2018. And I don't remember any memorable pro-trade comment by any Democrat running for uh, running for election in 2018. I haven't seen trade as reversing Trump's threats to the trade system prominent on any of the current 20 plus Democratic candidates this year. So clearly, and, and when you look at our survey, you, specific, when you look at specific things, the public is divided on whether we're doing, being tough enough on China, tough on China whether we should have steel and aluminum tariffs. I mean, the trade community would say the steel and aluminum tariffs are outrageous great breach, an unjustified breach of the system. But the public doesn't necessarily view it that way. And so you have a, 
So I think part of the problem we have here is that, and we're trying to make this a platform for future presidential candidates to run against the current administration is, it's not, they don't see it partly fully that way, and it's not that important relative to other issues. I should, we should emphasize that, that it's very divided in terms of tariffs yeah, exactly. on China, very divided along partisan lines. There is um, a bipartisan consensus that there's a problem with China, um, just the Republicans are ready to to, to push against the rules and use uh, use the the system as as far as, to go as far as we can, while Democrats are more concerned about upholding the system, upholding the rules of the system. Okay, well, we have a long line of people now at the microphone, so we'll start with Joe Gagnon from the Peterson Institute. Please identify yourself when you uh, step up uh, to ask a question. Well, thanks, uh, Mark. I take it since you identified me, I I don't have to. Uh, so. We're now two and a half years after, you ran the survey two and a half years after the election of Donald Trump, uh, and you, you kind of went out of your way to avoid the issue that he has mentioned almost every single day for three years, uh, which is a, why he's concerned about trade, which is the trade deficit. I don't see that anywhere in your questions or your analysis. So I'm wondering why did you sort of try to avoid that 500 pound gorilla in the room in terms of asking people what they thought about trade? I'd like to know if, of course, as economists, we can say the deficit isn't so obviously a bad thing the way that the president seems to think, but what do people think? I'd like to know. If uh, we had had a trade surplus for the last 40 years instead of a trade deficit, would views be different in any way? Would it matter? Uh, so you know, what, I'd like to hear what you think, or what, what do you think people would have said if you yeah, would have asked um, them that? I, I can speak from having done focus groups on these, these topics. It's not what comes to people's um, mind. It's, it's all about jobs and factors going overseas and, and the availability of cheap goods and things like that. The trade deficit is, is, is pretty, um, it's, not, it's not top of mind. Um, uh, it, it, it might be worthwhile to, 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 to dig into it more deeply, but, but it's just not the, a key factor in, in, uh, um, in, in, in the way people construct the, this issue. Yeah, let, yeah, just to add a little bit. Um, well, some may, but... Yeah, it, it's just not how people formulate it. It's not, it just doesn't, it doesn't uh, um, you know, they... They don't like factories going overseas. They don't. They they know that it's nice to have the cheap goods, but that can undermine local producers. That's sort of the the, the frame, uh, and so factories shut down because of the cheap goods from abroad. That's the narrative. That's the Spruce Springsteen story, you know, um, and 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 that can all get embedded in the trade deficit. But that's not the way. That's not the narrative that they use to talk about it. Just a little bit more on that. We we talked back, went back and forth about whether what kind of form, questions might we formulate about the trade deficit. It's actually, it's kind of hard when you I mean it's when it's not a prominent, not really that prominent. Even though Trump has used it, it's the deficit is not as prominent as as certainly as it was in the 1980s. Even though it's it, by some measure larger, both proportionately and uh, um, so I think the. Uh, we, we basically found, you know, the, the degree of macroeconomic education is required to sort of formulate, brief people on that might not be, we would have gotten a mixed result, we thought, in the end. So we didn't end up asking that, but obviously we could have. Scott Miller with CSIS, uh, what I hope is a simple question. How did you classify respondents as Republican, Democrat, and Independent? What questions did you ask? Is this party affiliation? Is it self-identification? Is it voting? What, what, what led you to classify respondents? As, uh, because that breakout is actually really important. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll, I'll turn to our methodologist, uh, Evan Faisenfeld. It's all self-identification. Yeah. Well, what, of your 3,000 sample, what proportion was each, roughly speaking? Okay, how does that So go? we included the leaners. Yeah. All self-identified, oh, okay, that yes. makes sense. If you don't push leaners, it's about, it's about one-third, one-third, one-third. A little larger, Democrats. Yes. Okay, thank you. Very helpful. 
terrific study, and thank you. Uh, Bill Lane, uh, Trade for America. Uh, agriculture has traditionally, during at least my career, been the biggest advocates for, for open trade, free trade. Um, I was moderating a panel in Omaha the day the uh, tariffs came out on soybean, soybeans, and um, I reminded everybody about the Soviet grain embargo and got a unanimous response that they never recovered. They seeded the market, and it, they didn't like Carter, and they still don't like Carter. Um, I then talked about the soybean uh, tariffs, and the reaction was much different. It was much more muted. It was, you know, sometimes you got to do something differently. If we lose our markets, if we, if we get hurt, so be it. Um, how much of this is the fact that the, av or the, the biggest advocates for open markets have largely had a muted voice, and how much of this is the fact that people are actually changing their views on trade? Well, my take is that it's not that they're changing their view on trade. It's that they they do perceive that there's a problem. And I've always been to some extent surprised how strong this narrative is that we've been taken advantage of, um, particularly by China, and that it's time that we have to do something to push back. Uh, and if we have to suffer some as a result um, and for a while, uh, and my, that's my understanding of the, how, how the, the, the farmers are, are, are basically explaining this to themselves in, in conjunction with their support for Trump. Um, and if, if it, and, and if there is, it produces a result, uh, they're, they're, uh, probably going to be happy with it. All that is actually consistent with support for trade. You know, it's not, it's, it's just that. There is a perception that the, the, the trade regime is a good thing, but China has been cheating. China's been pushing the edge. We've been playing Mr. Nice Guy for too many years. People are walking all over us. It's time for us to stand up and push back, not to abandon trade, but to get the system to stand up and walk right. And that's a, I think that's a coherent position. It's, it doesn't imply, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's not contradictory. And as someone who's been watching these issues for a while, um, the notion of the United States isn't getting a fair deal, now we're going to finally be tough and insist on our rights, is a very old notion. Uh, Bob Strauss be confirmation hearings before Russell Long in the Senate Finance Committee, a lot of that flavor, um, a lot of that flavor in, in other, you know, uh, why, when are we finally going to get a fair deal? When are we, it's, it's been part of the sort of standard litany. And... Uh, we're more sinned against than sinning, I think Peter Flanagan said during the uh, uh, Nixon administration. So it's not, a, it's not a new sentiment. It may or may not be stronger today. Uh, it may be stronger among certain groups today, but it's, not, it's, it's been around a long time. It, it extends well beyond trade. In fact, it may not most, be most fundamentally about trade. It goes through the whole narrative that we know we had to intervene in Europe twice for, in two world wars, uh, the German Marshall Plan. Uh, there's all, there are these assumptions that we spend huge amounts of money on foreign aid all over the world constantly. Uh, so all of these, um, uh, this, this, this narrative of overextension on the, the part of the U.S. and the U.S. doing more than its fair share is, 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 is an ongoing theme, and there is a, a narrative that we let our markets be open and you know take in all the other goods while we, while others were protectionist, and there's some truth to that too, um, um, but all of that has has kind of blended into this uh, this the sense of grievance that one can play on um, in 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 justifying this kind of uh, pushing back and and pushing against the rules and not being so um, fastidious about the rules. Hi, uh, Emily Follett from the Australian Embassy. And my question goes to um, your methodology, I think. Um, I'm interested um, in your decision to provide kind of background to your respondents on the arguments, you know, some level of detail in the arguments for and against the different propositions that you put before putting those propositions to them. And the reason I'm curious about that is that it seems that in politics, certainly in Australia, but perhaps as an outsider's view here as well, that the negative soundbite type arguments of politics... Um, they're they're of negative what? The negative soundbite type arguments, so tweets or you know, the one-line negative kind of uh, lines from politicians often cut through 
um, more effectively than a reasoned argument um, in or a positive vision, which is a sort of pro um, arguments in, in some of your propositions. So it seems when will voters, you know, voters out in the electorate, are they going to have the kind of education behind some of these arguments when they're considering the issues, or is it that your your sample has had the opportunity to sit to sit down and focus on the the theories behind it? So, um, as distinct from the average voter. So, I'm curious as to why you decided to to provide it in that format, and um, whether you've considered whether that would impact um, the results vis-a-vis -vis another approach. Um, with less context yep. to the well, arguments. Well, that, that, this is the whole uh, theory of public consultation, that um, there are different ways to, to survey the public. You can do it through what is a more traditional political style polling where the, uh, the question is very simple or there's a very simple slogan that, that's tested or something like that. What we find is that when you put all that, and, and we track all that and we've done a lot of polling like that, and when you put all that together, often it's not that easy to you know, make sense of it. So what we do, is, the, the idea here is that you're creating a system by which the public's values and priorities come to, come to bear in a coherent way that policymakers can actually receive as a kind of recommendation about how to proceed in terms of policy. And when you ask the public, they overwhelmingly say the, the conclusions that people come to when they have heard both sides of the issue should be what influences policy, not whatever immediately comes to their mind. Also, um, when um, with questions that are much simpler, you know, and, and short, and you know, like, um, they 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 tend to be much more reactive to current affairs, to to things that have happened in the news, uh, to what's happening with uh, you know political, well, the last thing they heard from a political candidate, and you don't necessarily get as clear a sense of what the underlying values and priorities are um, of the public. Um, so. It, uh, but with people who have actually thought about it a lot, they tend to be much more stable in their response. So what we're, we do is basically speeding it up and saying, all right, let's, let's really take people through the process of pushing them this way, that way, this way, and then the conclusions they come to are a more uh, stable guiding um, uh, set of principles for, for, uh, for governing policy. I'm not saying that the other things shouldn't happen as well. Uh, and we track that and try to put it together, make sense of, of, of how, uh, how, how it hangs together. And as, as Marx pointed out in his paper, when things, uh, the, 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 the economy goes up and down, you see shifts in the attitudes about trade. But what we were trying to get to something, uh, uh, something more fundamental. Is the support for the liberal world order, the, 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 the trade regime solid, or are people reacting to so recent policies, things that are going up and down related to trade and so on. So you you, you want to have both of them. They're, they're complementary, not an either or. Uh, David Orden from Virginia Tech. I work on agricultural trade and policy. So just a quick comment on the on the farm and the rural vote. Um, you know, it, it, we don't know how long this trade war will persist or how much damage will do to the agricultural sector, but the agricultural sector is feeling it some. And so it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next vote, whether there's any movement in the rural and, and agricultural vote, uh, like there was in the 1954 election, by the way, when, when the Republicans were viewed as too critical of farm support policies and the vote switch shifted over on the Democratic side after, after two years after Eisenhower was elected. Uh, I'm not saying it's an exact analogy, but just point out that historical parallel. My, my two questions are, you, you de-emphasize differences within the parties, but I'm wondering whether you saw differences, say, you know, what, ha what have happened to that uh, traditional Republican business support of trade, open trade, then Trump comes in, brings in a different constituency, and so you now have Republicans, a mix of Republicans, and likewise on the Democratic side, do you see any differences between, say, labor's view towards trade, you know, trade agreements, and you know, sort of um, upper upper middle class Democrats, let's just call them that for sure simplicity. And then my, my final follow-up question to that would be, suppose one of these 20 Democratic candidates did come to you, 
for some advice and said, I want to move the center of gravity back towards the center on trade issues. How can I do that given these various survey results you have? And you know, how can I generate a strategy to make that work? Let me respond a little bit to this. Uh, on the second question, just very quickly, and others may have a view as well, um, I think if it's to be used, if, if the issues are to be used, I think it is to emphasize the risks of the Trump approach as opposed to emphasizing that, I mean, saying the, the system is good is basically a foundation for worrying about the risks. But I think if I were a candidate wanting to use this issue, I would highlight risks, concerns, uh, fraying of relationships, things like that, uh, rather than a specific trade, uh, rather than a specific trade argument. I think that would be the way that I would uh, go on that. Uh, just on following on that, um, yeah, I think the the question of of putting the trade uh, world trade system at risk, um, you know, the potential for a trade war, is a, is a salient uh, argument, and the polling shows that uh, there was a question that asked, "Do you think the tariffs uh, the, the tariffs that are being imposed on China are going to make things better or worse or uh, uh, have no effect?" And only twenty four percent thought it was going to be better. 47% thought they'd, it'd probably be worse. Um, so th that's w one thing, uh, you know, just uh, harking back to the level of support for the trade system per se, there is concern that the system could, could fall apart. But as for um, moving the, the, the needle in a positive direction, I would focus on all the the uh, m methods for mitigating the negative effects, and that that would be, I think, quite rather easy for Democrats to promote, um, and that Democrats overwhelmingly favor most of the, um, the the efforts. You know, whether it's trade adjustment assistance or unemployment insurance or worker retraining, uh, labor standards, and environmental standards. Just a very aggressive. You know, we're going to we're going to become come back stronger. We're going to be more effective in the world economy. Uh, we can compete. We we're, we can do it. We have a lot going. We can get out there. We don't have to. We don't have to use protectionism, and terrorism, or strong that kind of thing. Um, and uh, those arguments, which were laced throughout that the the, the um, in 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 the in this study, um, um, elicited a, a lot of positive responses. There was a, another question about historically. Yeah. So I have a question. At the... I have a question at the mic, and then I have Fred Burks in the front. So please go ahead. Great. Um, my name is Katie Stetch. I'm a reporter with the Wall Street Journal. My question was on the political divide related to Chinese tariffs. Were you surprised when you saw those results? Um, and in general, I'd love to know what surprised you uh, the most about what you saw when you started to see uh, the results. About what was surprised us most? Um, I was surprised at how robust that that you know 85, 86 percent number was for the system overall. I just, you know, that I guess I kind of thought there was going to be more, well, on one hand, on the other hand, and then you would have a little bit, you know, it would lean in the positive direction because the, the, the numbers show that. And in general, uh, there are questions out there that ask just about trade. But the, the, there's a real ability, in a sense, in people's minds to differentiate the system, which they actually think is a really important thing to sustain, and, and certain things that are happening in, in, in regard to trade. And then when you get down to the very specific things, like what kind of methods we should use, strategies we should use in regard to China, then you get a really sharp partisan break. Uh, and that's not really so surprising, but it's, but it's really sharp you know? um, and uh, and that makes it makes it a tough in terms of you know how you're going to uh, proceed um, uh, with uh, uh, US uh, uh, trade policy um, well, one, uh, a couple of points one is as the public becomes more polarized it becomes increasingly hard to ask a question that doesn't generate a response that's basically political allegiance based so if you say if we ask president trump has done the following do you support that or not your the question is not going to be the answer is not going to be about the issue anymore and you i would say 20 years ago it might have been more 
but now it'll be driven by what you think about President Trump. So I think part of the effort we make is, uh, is to try to uh, limit that, but we can't eliminate it. It's clearly part of the political era. Now, one, the surprise I mentioned earlier, I was surprised by the strong percentage of Democrats saying they supported NAFTA, which is contrary yeah. to what was the case 20 years ago, maybe even 10 years ago. So I, that, that was the one number that struck me. Uh, but I was also uh, surprised and pleased, as Stephen said, by the, per, by the strong number. And it, that goes back to what that suggests to me is that, that throughout, Democrats have actually been supportive, but there have been so many things about the outcomes of NAFTA that they're not happy about, that that's what they emphasize. But now that the thing, they perceive the system as in some way at risk, that there's an actual attack on the NAFTA, on NAFTA, then they go, wait a minute, I'm, 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 I am I'm, am for it. And you can see on those, there are a lot of trend line questions on, you know, is, is trade mostly good or mostly bad for the U.S. economy? Or the Gallup one about whether it's a threat or, or, or an opportunity? And you see things kind of bumping around. And then around 2016, they, they go way up, you know? Yeah, what it's happened? It's very interesting. There's <laughs> kind of a reverse. Right. I've written on other issues. There's a reverse pendulum effect sometimes. Uh, people react against what the administration in power is pursuing. And in this case, I think you may have some of that. Because by some, some surveys, <coughs> which weren't ours that we didn't publish, put, put on the screen, suggest, like Chicago and Council on Foreign Relations, a record support for the trade system by right. both parties. Right, and, and over 80% and I think on it has to, that Part of that explanation has to be a reaction to Trump in a sense, okay, well, let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Let's not pull, right. the, pull down the temple. But, but even Republicans went from 51 to 82% on that question. So the, you know, the way I read that is that, uh, that there is a perception that Trump has, in a sense, gotten gone too far in threatening the system. Yeah. And they're right. saying, wait a minute now, I, we don't want to threaten the whole system. And even Republicans were basically rooting him for him and saying, yeah, go ahead, push it, um, pose those tariffs on China. You know, anything specific, but underneath there, they're, they're, they're suddenly having a surge in the need to say, but let's be clear, we are in fact in favor of the growth of trade. Above 80% here we're talking about. Fred. At the start, you posed the question, uh, how can we reconcile these public attitudes that you describe with the positions of the parties? And I don't think we still quite have an answer to that. <laughs> and I want to push you a little, a little further on it um, and put it maybe in this context. You show this sharp increase in Republican skepticism about the merits of trade in the system. Is that simply a reflection of Trump's rhetoric and policies? I mean, is Trump reflecting the Republicans or are the Republicans reflecting Trump? So I, that my, is, my, yes. my, my temptation is <laughs> my temptation is to say <laughs> this big increase in Republican skepticism you show is simply following the leader. Uh, and it doesn't say anything too profound about the views of the people in a more fundamental sense. But that's a question. To me, more puzzling is the Democrats, where your findings show big increase in Democratic support, et cetera, et cetera, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Republicans. That certainly, as you said a minute ago, doesn't show up in anything Democratic Party, Democratic leaders have proposed any of that. Is that simply anti-Trump? Are the Democrats saying, well, Trump says <coughs> trade is bad, so Trump, so trade must be good. So, I mean, so how much of this, I mean, it's a circularity question in terms of your methodology. How much of it is just reflecting the current sentiments at the top and how much is not? My reconciliation, I don't have one, it goes back to what Marx said at the outset, what he says in his work, that much of this trade attitude is conflation with these broader identity and anxiety problems that are relatively new. That's an answer to Mac's question earlier. Mac 
uh, Mac's answer. Mac rightly said nothing new about this sense of the U.S. being put upon, beleaguered, paying an excessive price. We've heard that forever. Right. So what now makes it so salient? Well, A, <coughs> Trump has taken it up as a main cause. Yeah. And that's part of my answer, as I just said. But part of it may be, the substantive part may be Marx's analysis, which is resting on a lot of surveys and analysis done by political scientists, et cetera, et cetera, as you know, Mutz, et cetera, which all say this gets conflated with these much broader racial identity, anxiety, politics that are now so prevalent, anti-immigration sentiment, et cetera, et cetera. All gets wrapped up into one, xenophobia more broadly. So, I mean, are those the answers, and how does that yeah. interact with what you're uh, telling Steve, us in terms of public good question. attitudes? Stephen, you may want to speak to this, because okay. he's done some polling involving the broader issue, and feeling frustrations of Americans with a system, with the government, and so forth, which Trump... Uh, seems to have mirrored it successfully in his election campaign. I, my point would p partly be it is obviously the current numbers are affected by the Trump administration and the Trump initiatives. But, I, but if you look at the party allegiance trends, tri party uh, allocation in terms of what people thought of uh, with straight a good thing, I point to this uh, Gallup poll which suggested that this was before this turn to Democrats being more positive than Republicans became about 2011, 2012, when Trump, nobody was thinking about Trump, uh, even Ber and Bernie Sanders wasn't prominent either. So there wasn't a, so there is something underlying. I'm not quite sure what it is, frankly. I think the whole business of being conflated with other issues is absolutely right. So that's all, that's all I will say on it's it, the Republican leadership and the Republican public are have well but for both parties have been out of step significantly, and you you certainly saw uh, and that is something that Trump took advantage of. It's the um, Republican leadership, presumably, and and this was Trump's charge is that the, the the Republican leadership has been under the control of corporations and multinational corporations that are doing things that are in their interest. That extends to immigration to letting in cheap labor and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so and that he's he's come here to kick those guys out. Uh, the people who have been in charge. And he, you know, he had Kellyanne Conway reading the the, the surveys. Uh, showing that there was a real receptivity to those kinds of arguments among the uh, the Republican um, public, uh, Republican voters. Um, so that it, it's I don't I don't find that so mysterious. Um, Democrats have been uh, have been more positive than Republicans for for some time. There is a kind of coherent you know there is if you track the the, the Democratic Party, they have developed an agenda that the, the Clinton was pushing, you know, about being and Robert Reich and so on, uh, to associate the growth of trade and education and social programs and things like that. That's a, that's a coherent program that, that has, and, and, and you see that over time, that's kind of consolidated and um, before Trump, and then when Trump came in and actually tried to rattle, you know, challenge the system, it only made them consolidate even more. So that to me is a pretty clear, clear story. The Republican Party is more, much more conflicted uh, because you've got, you've got uh, elements in, in the party that are very pro-trade and that have had deep pockets and have been major donors. And then you have voters that are the swing voters and those, those you know, blue wall states, agricultural states that, um, that, they're, that they're targeting and, and that, they, that Trump succeeded in, in pulling in his, in his direction. And then you, you don't have the, um, and, and then you have the suspicion of government programs that, that, that gets into the mix. And so it's really hard to, you know, there's, there is not a, as coherent a Republican position. There's more chaos. You look at all those numbers, you go, go going from screen to screen, 
how does it all add up? So I think, you know, somebody's like, what, what can the Democrats do? I think it's a much harder question is how the Republicans can pull together their, their uh, um, constituency because it's pulling in, in, in multiple directions. Okay, well, we have reached our witching hour. Uh, I think this is a, a fantastic um, uh, program. Um, I've been to many, many, probably hundreds of uh, events at this institution, and I think we probably had the highest ratio of people asking questions to the audience <laughs> today, because uh, obviously people were very interested in this study. Uh, again, this is Americans on International Trade Policy. Now that I'm looking at it, I notice that the authors are not only only Stephen Cull and I am Dessler, but Evan Faisenfeld and Evan Charles <laughs> Levitis, Levitis, raise your hands, Lewis, Lewitis. Okay, sorry about that. Anyway, I recommend it very much, and please join me in thanking our presenters and the authors. Thank you. Program adjourned.